Well, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to the afternoon session. <laughs> we begin with a talk by Dick Gross. Dick Gross is no stranger to Oxford. I m first met him here uh, in my final year as an undergraduate. He came here as a Marshall Scholar. And we both suffered from uh, a severe problem that year in that Brian Birch had unfortunately gone off to Harvard and we found trouble finding number theory here. Uh, Dick solved this in a very original way by becoming chief musician to a group of Morris dancers. <laughs> but he caught up with Brian Birch later um, when he resolved a beautiful conjecture of Brian Birch which related Hegner points to L functions in the, of elliptic curves in the same way that Dirichlet's formula relates um, L functions to cyclotomic units. And he formulated, uh, he, in studying this problem, he formulated it in terms of the Rankine-Selberg formula, <laughs> and then together with, uh, Gross, with uh, Don Zagia, he proved it uh, in the early 80s. For this, he was awarded the Cole Prize in 1987. And despite various uh, lapses in his sanity since, such as when he became dean of students at Harvard, he has <laughs> had a wonderful uh, um, career in relating representation theory and number theory. And these conjectures he's going to talk about, the Gan gross prasad conjectures, um, give us a wonderful new tool and insights to extending uh, theorems like the theorem of gross the theorem of Valspergé, and are very intimately related with, um, as it turns out, with the trace formula. So without more ado, I'm very happy to hand over to Dick. Thanks, thanks Andrew. I, I should say that it was a lot of fun getting to know Andrew uh, when we were both students at Oxford. And he explained a lot of things about life in England to me. And I was telling him we went for a walk once. Uh, we left the Math Institute, which wasn't in this beautiful building, but it was in the building where the poor statistics department is now located. And, uh, and we walked over into the university parks, and there was a, 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 a cricket match going on, which was completely incomprehensible to me. And he explained uh, what was happening. And uh, while we were there, the match appeared to be over. And uh, people came off the field, and I, I asked them who won. And they said, well, actually, it was a, a draw. Uh, they, they had run out of time or something. And, and, and uh, I said, you, you, I said to Andrew, what, what kind of idiot activity is this? You play for three days, and you end up with a draw. <laughs> and, and he said, well, wouldn't it have been terrible if someone had lost? <laughs> so uh, I, I'm happy to be here to speak. I want to thank the Clay Institute for their very kind invitation. And so I, I really want to give credit to my collaborators, Tech Gan and Dipendra Prasad. He, Dipendra's here at the moment. He's, he works at the IIT Mumbai. And Tech couldn't make it because he's running a program at Oberwolfach. And uh, he, he's at the National University of Singapore. So the conjectures I'm going to speak about, there are really three uh, sort of nested conjectures. <clears throat> And I'll try to describe each of them to you and the progress that's been made on them. The first, which is almost now solved, is what we call the local case. And it was an attempt to generalize uh, classical branching formulas for compactly groups. And that's where I'll start. And the second, uh, as Andrew mentioned, uh, is what we call the global case. And it, it generalizes a very uh, uh, amazing formula of Waldsperge, which was proved in the 1980s about the periods of of automorphic forms on GL2. And the third, uh, which is the most open problem, most interesting to me, I call the arithmetic case. And that, that's an attempt to generalize the formula I found with Don Zagier. So uh, a good reference, if you want to read about all these conjectures, they're in a volume of asterisk, uh, number 346. OK, so uh, here we go. Here's the logo of the conference, right? And I want to I want to give a very hard time to uh, Jordy, uh, who who stole this. Uh, this is our logo. You know, the, all all the four meetings submitted a logo, and we won. So this is what what is this? So as Jordy said, it's a, it's an attempt to illustrate 
subject that's called spherical harmonics. And to remind you of that, uh, spherical harmonics studies the functions on the two-sphere in three-space. And the two-sphere is an orbit for the orthogonal group in three variables, the compact orthogonal group. And you want to study the functions on the two-sphere as a represent linear representation of the orthogonal group and decompose it into irreducible representations. And the way you do that is you consider the vector space of homogeneous polynomials of degree L uh, on three space. And you're going to restrict those polynomials to the two sphere. And that's a, that, that space of homogeneous polynomials is a representation of uh, the orthogonal group. Because if you sub make a linear substitution, you preserve the degree of a homogeneous polynomial. And, uh, and it's an irreducible representation for the general linear group of three variables. But it's not irreducible for the special orthogonal group. And you have to get a submodule of it to get an irreducible representation. And the submodule you take are the functions that are annihilated by the Laplace operator, the harmonic functions. And, uh, that's an invariant differential operator for the orthogonal group if x, y, and z are orthogonal coordinates on, on R3. And when you take the submodule annihilated by the uh, Laplacian, you get a vector space of dimension 2L plus 1, where L is the degree. So for degree 1, you just get the constant. Uh, degree 0, you get the constants. For degree 1, you get the linear polynomials. And there are, there's a six-dimensional space of quadratic polynomials, but uh, they're not all annihilated by the Laplacian, so it's a five-dimensional representation. And the theorem is that the functions on the sphere are somehow a completed direct sum of these irreducible representations of dimension 2L plus 1. And uh, if you have a function on the sphere that, that uh, has only a finite dimensional space of translates under the orthogonal group, then it's in, uh, then it's in the algebraic, some of these representations. And this is somehow like a decomposition of the functions on the circle into a Fourier series. Uh, I think the subject is called harmonic analysis because it uses this, this uh, differential operator. And uh, it was introduced by, uh, of course, Laplace. But from our point of view, uh, what's more important is going to be the decomposition of this representation WL because, as you notice, uh, here, here's supposed to be the trivial representation on top, and then the three-dimensional representation on linear polynomials, the five-dimensional on quadratic, the seven-dimensional on cubic. But it, it somehow decomposes into lines, as you already pointed out. And that decomposition comes from the restriction of this representation on SO3 to the subgroup that fixes a point on the sphere, which is isomorphic to the rotation group SO2, itself isomorphic to the multiplicative group of complex numbers of absolute value 1. And you can see that isomorphism by projecting to a plane orthogonal to the uh, axis of the rotation. And uh, then it's just the rotations around the circle in that plane. And uh, <coughs> so this is an abelian group. Uh, and its irreducible representations all have dimension 1 and consist, if you think of the group as the multiplicative of the circle, of taking a, a point on the circle z and taking it to its nth power. Well, where m is an integer, and those integers give the irreducible representations of SO2. And the famous decomposition of this representation is a representation of SO2 is you get the, the characters uh, z to the m for uh, the m of absolute value less than l. And there are, there are exactly 2l plus 1 such integers. And that decomposes the space canonically into a sum of lines. And of course, uh, people looked for formulas of uh, the, s the functions, the, the, the specific uh, homogeneous polynomials of degree L that lie on each line. In particular, the trivial representation of the special orthogonal group in two variables always occurs. That's the case m equals 0. And that's uh, sometimes called the spherical function. And there are beautiful formulas for these spherical functions in terms of special functions. <coughs> OK. So that's the first decomposition, really, that occurs in, in the literature uh, of, a, of a representation of a non-abelian group. But people were quick to, to uh, generalize these results. And we can also, instead of restricting from the special orthogonal group in three variables to two variables, we could take an irreducible representation of the orthogonal group in, in 2n plus 1 variables and restrict it to the subgroup. It fixes a, uh, a line in that 2n plus 1 dimensional space. And that becomes the special orthogonal group in 2n variables. <coughs> and there's a, to uh, talk about that restriction, you have to know what the names of the representations are. Like we had representations of SO3 indexed by an integer, their, or their dimension, 2l plus 1. The representations of SO2 were powers. But you need the names of these irreducible representations. And 
That comes from uh, the theory of, uh, of Carton and, and uh, Elie Carton and Herman Weil. Uh, Jordy mentioned that. So the representations uh, which are irreducible of SO2 n plus 1 of that compact Lie group, uh, well, he indexed them by their highest weights. Uh, I prefer to use the uh, <coughs> infinitesimal character, which is the highest weight plus the, the simplest weight that lies in the interior of the vial chamber. That's sometimes called rho. And uh, when you do that, and you actually work it out what the wild vial chamber looks like for the odd orthogonal group, they're indexed by half integers, and the integer, half integers lie in, in, in a cone. So this looks a little complicated, but those, that's the, 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 the infinitesimal character is really what comes into the vial character formula and the vial dimension formula. And uh, so, for example, uh, if you did the SO3 case, so that's n equal 1, then uh, there's only one alpha, it's, it's a half integer greater than zero, and when you multiply it by two, you get an odd integer, and that's the dimension of the representation, and there are formulas for the dimension of these uh, representations from the alphas uh, in general. And the representations of the even orthogonal group, if you use the infinitesimal character parameterization, are indexed by uh, integers, uh, which, real integers, not half integers, that lie in the interior of the cone, and uh, they satisfy these inequalities, but, so they're all positive integers, except for the last one, which is an arbitrary integer, like we saw for SO2, which you could have an integer power. That's the, the m, uh, the beta n is the m for SO2. And the restriction is given by a beautiful formula, which is called the branching law, where um, if you take this w alpha, given by those half integers, and you restrict it to SO2n, you get you get a direct sum of finite number of irreducible representations of SO2n, and you get exactly the beta that, that, that intertwine with the alpha. They can't be equal because the betas are integers and the alphas are half integers. And uh, so the betas are in some bounded region, and uh, so there are only finitely many of them, and you get that direct sum. And for us, a very important thing from this branching formula is that the irreducible representations of the even orthogonal group occur with multiplicity 0 or 1 in the restriction of any irreducible representation. Namely, there are no multiplicities. There usually are multiplicities when you do a representation. But here, uh, there are none. And since this restriction is what we call multiplicity-free, it says that if you take any two representations, w of SO2n plus 1, which is irreducible, and u of SO2n, that the dimension of the space of homomorphisms from u into w, which is the multiplicity of u in w, uh, is less than or equal to 1. It's either 0 or 1. And uh, you could write that as the homomorphisms over the diagonally embedded subgroup SO2n of the representation w tensor, the dual of u. These representations are very close to being self-dual, uh, it turns out this dimension is the same as for u and, or the dual of u. But in any case, this, this, this space of homomorphisms that intertwines the inter representations is either zero or one-dimensional. And that persists even if you start to do representations of non-compact real Lie groups, which people did initially in mathematical physics, and then it became a great subject in mathematics. And so, for example, it turns out that if you take the hyperbolic orthogonal group of, of signature 2n1, so that's a non-compact group, uh, and it has an infinite dimensional representation in the discrete series with exactly the same parameters as these finite dimensional representations of compact groups. We're later going to talk about L packets. It turns out these representations are in the same L packet. And its restriction to the compact subgroup, which is almost, which is of index 2 max in the maximal compact subgroup, SO2n, is also given by a branching formula. And here, the beta intertwine with the alphas, but they're not, beta 1 is not between alpha 1 and alpha 2, but, but it's bigger than alpha 1. And in particular, for this branching formula, there are an infinite number of beta that occur, because beta 1 is completely unrestricted, other than it's being bigger than alpha 1. And so that's reasonable because this w, V alpha is an infinite dimensional representation of this non-compact group, and we're restricting to a compact group, and these are all finite dimensional, so there better be an infinite number of them. And so we see that the multiplicities, again, 
are less than or equal to 1. And the multiplicity of u beta in v alpha is 0 if the betas don't branch in this way, and is 1 if the betas do. OK. Well, well, let's see if I can get further. It turns out, and this was a theorem long in development, that for any irreducible representation of a special orthogonal group in odd variables, uh, two n plus one variables, if you restrict it to an orthogonal group fixing a line in that space, a non-isotropic line, so you get a, an orthogonal group in two n variables, that restriction is always multiplicity free, whether or not the representation, whether or not these groups are compact or not. And it works not just over the real numbers, but over any local field, so the piatic numbers or Laurent series over a finite field. And this, the general picture of this restriction being multiplicity free was something that was studied by Gelfond and his school, in particular Kajdan and Bernstein. And this theorem was worked out by uh, a whole bunch of people, Eisenbud and Gorevich and Zhu. And, uh, as, but and now we happen to know that the restriction is multiplicity free. And so, as I say, this hom is either zero or one dimensional. And the whole local conjecture that we got involved in, I was sort of dragged into it by Dependra, um, was the, the question of mm, what is the branching formula for which two representations of SO2n plus one and SO2n is the hom of one dimension or in which it's zero dimensional. So that's what the local conjecture attempts to address. And it addresses it in a very strange way, uh, maybe uh, not in retrospect, but I remember the first time I, I gave this conjecture, it was a representation theory conference in Ohio State, and I was met with stunned silence. I mean, that was, that was the reaction. Okay, so to address the local question of how, how these representations restrict, we're gonna have to leave the harmonic analysis of Pierre Laplace's mécanique céleste, which is where he developed the theory of functions on the two-sphere. And we're going to move to the harmonic analysis in John Tate's PhD thesis, which is entitled Fourier analysis in number fields and Hecke's zeta function. So you might not think that was connected with mécanique céleste, but in fact it is. So what are Hecke's zeta functions? So the zeta functions that Hecke studied are all generalizations of the Riemann zeta function. And <clears throat> all of these functions are defined by a product over the different places of a number field, which converges in some half plane of the complex numbers. So the famous zeta function has a product, which was discovered by Euler, usually when people only write the product over all the primes. But in Tate's thesis, he realized that this factor, which is used in its functional equation, is the term one adds at infinity. And there are integrals that give this factor at the prime p. And when you do the same integral at the real numbers, you get this factor. So there's one factor for each place of the rational numbers. And the big theorem, which, which began with Riemann and then ended with Hecke, really, is that these functions have a meromorphic continuation to the entire plane. This, this product only converges for real part of s greater than 1. And if you meromorphically continue them to the plane, they satisfy a functional equation, which for this function happens to be that its value at s is the same as its value at 1 minus s. OK, now Hecke went beyond that. And he defined new L functions. So to do that, I'll start with a number field. This is for the rational numbers. And a number field has associated to it a ring of Adels, which is the restricted product of all the completions of the number field. The restriction means that in this product, you get an element of each local completion, but almost all of those elements have to be integral. And <clears throat> the multiplicative group of this ring, or the units of this ring, are called the edels. And that's also a restricted product over the multiplicative group of the completions. And again, in every term, you, almost all the elements have to be units in the local field. OK. And a Hecke character, which is what generalizes the Riemann zeta function, is a homomorphism continuous from this multiplicative group of edels to the complex numbers, which is trivial when restricted to the diagonally embedded multiplicative group of the field. So it, a character of the edels is just given by a product of characters of these local completions. That's not so difficult to write down. It, they have to have some property at almost all places. They have to be unramified. But what makes it interesting is if it's trivial on the in diagonally embedded subgroup of the 
multiplicative group in the field. I should say that that's the genius of the invention of Adels and Edels. If you just took the direct sum, then it wouldn't contain the field. And if you took the whole direct product, not the restricted direct product, it wouldn't be locally compact. But with, these, with this notion that Chevrolet discovered uh, of taking the restricted products, you get a locally compact group. The field multiplicative group embeds it as a discrete subgroup, and so you can consider, consider continuous such characters. And when you have such a Hecke character, you define the L function of the Hecke character as an Euler product over all the places of the field, and the local term depends only on the local character at that place. So for example, this is a Hecke L function, where the character is the trivial character of the Adels. So that's certainly trivial on the field. And then the term at the prime p is 1 minus p to the s inverse, and the term at infinity turns out to be this. So it, there's a recipe for these local terms. And when you take that product, it always converges in some right half plane. That would be true for an arbitrary character of the Dells that was almost everywhere unramified. But the key thing that Hecke proved was that there was always an, an analytic continuation and functional equation. The functional equation becomes more complicated. It relates the value of the character at s to the value of the complex conjugate at 1 minus s. There's an, uh, there's, a const, there's an exponential term. And there's a constant in the functional equation, which is a complex number of absolute value 1. And Tate gave a new proof of Hecke's functional equation uh, using local methods, idyllic methods. And the key, one of the key things he added to it was he was able to factor, Artin had already factored this constant, but Tate was able to factor the local constant into terms, a product of local terms that depended only on the local components of the Hecke character. And these epsilon factors were almost all one, so this infinite product was really a finite product. And that was a tremendous advance. I, I, I think Tate's thesis really changed the whole direction of, of 20th century uh, number theory. Now, uh, these local epsilon factors that Tate discovered satisfy a lot of nice properties. For example, from the functional equation point of view, if you do it twice, it's clear that epsilon of chi times epsilon of chi bar is, is 1. But the local factors don't quite do that. They, if you take epsilon of character and then you take epsilon of its complex conjugate, you don't get 1. You get the value of the character at minus 1. Remember, chi v is a character of kv star. And the product of all of these is 1, so the global thing works out fine by um, that's part of local class field theory. Now, since I've mentioned local class field theory, I should say that these characters of kv star, which uh, Tate was studying, by local class field theory, they give one-dimensional representations of a non-abelian group called the V group. In local class field theory, it says that K, this multiplicative group of, of a local field is almost it's Galois group. Of course, that's not true for the reals. But in the p-adic case, it's very close. The Galois group is, the only difference is that this is a, a locally compact group, and, and the Galois group is a profinite group. So it's, it's compact. And, and so you have, to, you have to do something with kv star. And, and they realized that there was a group closely related to the Galois group whose abelianization was exactly this group. So the characters of this group gave one-dimensional representations of this group. And I'll just tell you what the V group is for all our local fields, and we'll just move on. This is not how you define it, believe me. But for the complex numbers, it's just the multiplicative group of the complex numbers. And for the real numbers, it's a group which is almost abelian. It's the normalizer of the complex numbers in Hamilton's quaternions. So the complex num multiplicative group complex numbers, then it has another coset, which is the multiplicative group times j. And uh, that maps, of course, to the Galois group of the real numbers by taking its connected component. Likewise, this maps to the Galois group of the complex numbers by taking its connected component. And in the p case, the V group turns out to be a subgroup of the Galois group. And it's exactly the subgroup of elements where, if you look at their action on the residue field, you get an integral power of the Frobenius automorphism and not a, a completed integral power. So that's the V group. And since Tate had already produced these epsilon factors for one-dimensional representations of the Vey group, people naturally asked if one could define local epsilon factors for higher dimensional representations of the Vey group, which is really non-abelian theory. And they had to satisfy a lot of properties. Uh, Artin had proved that L functions behave very well with respect to induction of characters. And so you wanted the local constants to behave well. And Langland started out with a very, very long proof. And 
Finally, Deline found a very, uh, a very compact proof and defined these local epsilon factors for higher dimensional representations. And the analog of that formula that chi v, uh, the epsilon chi v, epsilon chi v bar is chi v of minus one is that if you take the product of the epsilon factor for a representation times the epsilon factor of the dual representation, it's always plus or minus one. You take the determinant of the representation, you get a one-dimensional representation. You think of that as a character of kv star by local class field theory, and you evaluate it minus one. So this is the formula Deline found. And once you had that formula, people wondered, well, if I have a representation that's isomorphic to its dual, so this side is just epsilon squared, and the tr determinant is a trivial, then uh, epsilon squared is one, so epsilon has to be plus or minus one. And, and it was a very important question in number theory to decide whether epsilon was one or epsilon was minus one in this case. So Deline found a beautiful interpretation in the self-dual case when the representation was orthogonal, when it was self-dual by a symmetric bilinear form. And in that case, you have a homomorphism from the Bay group to this special orthogonal group that has a double cover by the spin group. And Deline showed, grosso modo, that the epsilon factor was one precisely when the representation lifted to the spin group and was minus one otherwise. So this sign was an obstruction to lifting to the spin group. That's a very satisfactory explanation. But if the representation is self-dual with a symplectic pairing, an alternating bilinear form, there was no covering group. We didn't have any interpretation for this sign uh, that, that Deline had defined. And uh, believe me, that was, it seems very esoteric, but that's actually quite an important problem in number theory. And I was interested in it because if you study the L functions, for example, of elliptic curves, or you study the L functions of abelian varieties, those are symplectic Galois representations. And the sign in the functional equation of the global L function, which turns out to be a product of these, just like in Tate's case, well, you'd like to know whether that's plus one or minus one. That has implications for the conjecture of Birch and Swinnert and Dyer. And to compute the global sign, you want to compute these local signs. And so these symplectic root numbers in the case of elliptic curves or abelian varieties were a subject of a lot of interest. And they're still quite mysterious. But <clears throat> the uh, surprising thing in the local conjecture is that it relates the restriction of branching laws from this uh, SO2m plus one to SO2n to exactly these signs of symplectic root numbers. So it's a connection, and I think that's what makes it so much fun, between a, a question of interest in representation theory, the restriction of irreducible representations, I mean, that's, that's what harmonic analysis really is, to a question of interest in number theory computing these symplectic epsilons. And I would say that, um, when I show, I'll show you the conjecture, but the ultimate, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the result of it is, and now it's, it's pretty much proved, that um, if you ever knew anything about the symplectic epsilons, you'd know something about the restriction and vice versa, but you really don't know anything about either of them. <laughs> okay, so um, the, the way we're going to do this and the bridge that was created between representation theory and number theory that we're going to go across was built by Robert Langlands, and that's been mentioned in several talks. Here's a picture of uh, Langlands when he began his great discoveries, and this is, this is a copy of his uh, famous Yale lectures on Euler products, uh, where he began to, uh, he, he used the theory of Eisenstein series, where these L functions appear as the constant term, and uh, began to uh, realize uh, the amazing connections with number theory. So mm, I'll, I'll do the summary of what I need. Uh, Jordy was also stealing my thunder in this, but never mind, never mind, Jordy. Um, he, so one of Langland's conjectures for the special orthogonal group is that uh, the names of irreducible representations for these special orthogonal groups over local fields are simply parameterized by symplectic representations of the Ve group, actually the ve deline group, but who's counting? And if I want to do SO2m plus one, I should take symplectic representations of dimension 2n. That's because the symplectic group is the Langlands dual of the odd orthogonal group. So that's amazing. I mean, the names that we want uh, are, are encoded in the representations we want to study. And moreover, uh, for the even orthogonal group, they're parameterized by orthogonal uh, representations of the Ve group of dimension 2n. And here there's a condition that the determinant of the representation, which is a quadratic character of the Ve group, 
corresponds to the quadratic extension you get from the discriminant of the orthogonal space that's underlying the orthogonal group. Uh, that's because, this, in this case, the orthogonal group is kind of the L group, not the special orthogonal group would be the dual group. Okay, so how does this jibe with what we already knew for compact real groups? I mean, these conjectures of Langlands include the case of compact groups where we already have a description of the irreducible representations by highest weight. So how could that possibly be related to this? Well, you see, the Vey group of R is a very simple group. It contains an abelian subgroup of index 2, the uh, multiplicative group of the complex numbers. And if you take a character of the complex number z over z bar, you can study that character for a, a um, half integer, or an integer. I'm certainly, for an integer, this is a character of C star, and you can take its induction to the Vey group of R, which is a two-dimensional representation. But even if A is a half integer, this makes sense, because if you multiply numerator and denominator by Z, you get Z to the 2A over ZZ bar to the, uh, sorry, if you multiply by, yeah, by a <coughs> Z to the A, you get Z to the 2A in the numerator. That makes sense, because 2A is an integer. And then you have ZZ bar to the A in the denominator. But that makes sense, because ZZ bar is positive, and you can take any power you want. So for A, a half integer or integer, you get a two-dimensional representation of the Vey group of R. And it turns out to be symplectic if A is a half integer, and orthogonal if A is an integer. And the parameter of the irreducible representation W alpha, where we had a string of n half integers, is the direct sum of these two-dimensional representations of the Vey group, which is a symplectic representation of dimension 2n. And likewise, for the orthogonal group, we had a bunch of integers, and you take those induced representations, each of dimension 2, and you take their direct sum, and that gives you uh, a 2n dimensional orthogonal representation. It turns out to have the right determinant, and that gives you a parameter for our, so that's the way you pass in the Langlands world from uh, highest weights or, or infinitesimal characters to, uh, to Langlands parameters. OK, but the key thing is that Langlands works not just for compact real groups, but for non-compact real groups and p-adic groups, et cetera. OK. Now, in fact, after Langlands proposed this, he had done a lot of work for the general linear group where everything works nicely. But people discovered that for these uh, Classical, even for classical groups, um, the, the parameterization was not one-to-one, -one, but these parameters, these homomorphisms to the symplectic group or to the orthogonal group, actually parameterized a finite set of representations, which is called an L packet. We already saw that in the real case, that the same infinitesimal character appeared for representations of the compact orthogonal group and also for the non-compact orthogonal group. And uh, those all correspond to the same Langlands parameter. And in fact, this L packet doesn't just contain a finite number of representations of one group, but it contains representations of different forms of that group, what are called inner forms of the group, because they share the same L group. And we now know much more about L packets through the work of uh, many people, Lustig in particular. And uh, in fact, the L packets are indexed by characters or irreducible representations of a finite group, the component group of the centralizer of the parameter. Uh, I mean, these parameters are really only up to conjugacy anyhow. So the, the centralizer of the parameter is the stabilizer of the parameter in that sense. And you take, it has, it's, a, it's a reductive algebraic group, but it's not necessarily connected. So you take its connected component that gives you a finite group. And in the case of, in the case of these uh, classical groups where you take the centralizer of the parameter in these groups and you use Schur's lemma to calculate it, it turns out the component group is an elementary abelian two group and the two comes from the fact that there are products of orthogonal groups in the centralizer, and we all know that orthogonal groups are not connected. OK. So uh, to really nail down an irreducible representation, we would have to give these symplectic or orthogonal representations. And we would also have to give a character of this component group of the centralizer. OK. So here's the local conjecture. It says, that in each L packet, which is generic, and generic means contains one large representation, the, the representation of the largest gelfand kirillov dimension for the group, then there's a unique element in that L packet, W a representation of, of SO2M plus 1, U a representation of SO2N, with the property that U occurs in the restriction of W to SO2N. There's a unique representation in this whole L packet, 
And if there's a unique representation, we have to tell you what its character is on the component group. And the character is given by this formula using local epsilon factors. That's what's so amazing. So it says that if you have an element A in the centralizer in SPM, you take the subspace of M where A acts as minus 1. That's a subsymplectic representation. You tensor it with this orthogonal representation. Symplectic tensor orthogonal is still symplectic. You take the plus or minus 1 that's given by Deline's construction of local epsilons. You multiply it by this very simple plus or minus 1. You take the determinant of the orthogonal representation. That's a quadratic character. You evaluate it at minus 1. You take it to this power. And it turns out that this doesn't depend on where A is in the centralizer. It only depends on which component it's in the centralizer, and likewise for B. So this gives a function on the component group of the centralizer with values in plus or minus 1. And once I guessed that function, I had to guess that it was a homomorphism. right? It's got to be a homomorphism. And so it's a homomorphism, and that gives an, an irreducible representation. And so that picks something out of the L packet. And the conjecture is there's a unique representation in the L packet, and this is its character. OK. So in particular, if you, one element in the centralizer is the elements in the center. And both these groups have a center of order um, 2. So if you take the element in the center of SP2M, it's given by the, uh, the, eps, the, the character is given by this formula. If you take the element in the center of SO2N, the character is given by the same formula. And that shows that the, the orthogonal spaces, which are picked out by this character, one is actually contained in the next one. You couldn't have a restriction problem unless the, the even orthogonal space was a submodule of the odd orthogonal space. So that's good. And in fact, it gives this sign here, it gives the Hasse-Witten symbol of the relevant orthogonal spaces. If you know orthogonal spaces over local fields, at least over the piatics, are classified by their rank, their discriminant, and a, and a sign, which is their Hasse-Witt invariant. And that's given by this formula on the center. OK, well, the good news is that the local conjectures for orthogonal groups were completely proved in an amazing piece of work by uh, Jean-Luc Valdes-Perger, who I picture here uh, in 2010, and I believe a year or two after that, for this piece of work, he was awarded the, the Clay Research Prize. I think it's one of the great <coughs> papers written in representation theory this century. Uh, it was a huge surprise. I mean, we had, we had tested a number of cases of this conjecture. Uh, I, I didn't make it without some examples. We had some low rank groups, SO3, SO2, SO5, SO4. We had some very simple representations, as Jordy said, where the parameters were unramified or tamely ramified and even very mildly, wildly ramified. But nobody had the slightest idea one could prove this thing. And Valsperger pulled me into his office and told me how to prove it. And the proof is, uh, suffice it to say, highly ingenious. So it begins, it begins with the observation that if these groups were finite, we could try to prove this using character formula. Because if, if, if we were representing finite orthogonal groups, this dimension of the Hom space would be the dimension of the invariance in this, in this tensor product if they're self-dual. And that's given by the inner product of the trivial character with the product of the two characters summed over the finite group. So in, in finite group case, we know how to compute these uh, multiplicities using character theory. Well, there isn't an exactly a character for these infinite dimensional representations of p-adic groups, but there, it's a distribution. And on, on, on certain regular sets, it's actually a, a function. And Valsperger starts by writing a formula for this dimension, which we're supposed to prove is either 0 or 1. And by writing a formula in terms of integrals of the characters of the representations over conjugacy classes of tori in the group, and not just the compact torus, as you have for the vile character formula, but many, many different conjugacy classes. And then he had the brilliant idea to take these formulas and sum them over the L packet, because we're really trying to prove that the sum of the dimensions over the entire L packet is 1. That would, be, that would be it, because the dimensions are greater and equal to 0. So if you could prove the sum was 1. And when he summed over the L packet, an amazing thing happens. All the integrals over tori cancel except for one term. And you can see that for generic L packets, using the Whitaker function, that term is equal to 1. So the sum of the dimensions turned out to be 1. And refining this method, he also found integral formulas for the epsilon factors and was able to check that the one thing in the L packet was the one thing we predicted. And I should say, again, 
always provided that the representations lie in a generic L packet, which means there's one element in the L packet where the representation is a maximal Galfan-Karilov dimension. And that's very useful, but of course, it doesn't, it doesn't answer many of the most interesting questions you'd like to ask. For example, if you wanted to study functions on the hyperboloid, you'd want to know which representations of an odd orthogonal group restricted to the trivial representation of the special orthogonal group in two n variables, and that's not a generic L packet unless it's compact. And, and, and so, um, so we're working now to try to generalize these conjectures to non-generic L packets, and that's very interesting from the point of view of uh, computing uh, cohomology, et cetera. Okay, so let's go to the uh, global conjecture. That's the first conjecture, the local conjecture. And as I say, from work of Walsperger and, and the people who followed him, I would say that conjecture is almost completely known. Oh, good. Better keep moving here. Okay, so if K is a number field, we'll take a, a product of orthogonal groups defined over that number field, namely from orthogonal spaces defined over the number field, one contained in the next. And um, we think of H, this, this special orthogonal group in the smaller number of variables as being diagonally embedded. And um, here, we take that ring of Adele's that was introduced and used in Tate's thesis, and we, we study an Adelic representation of the group G. And all that is, is uh, that's called W tensor U, and that's a product of local representations of the local groups that we've just been considering, but uh, almost all of them have to be what are called unramified. And uh, we make one more assumption, and we assume that this representation occurs as a submodule of the space of automorphic forms, which are basically functions on the adelic points of this group, uh, which are left invariant under the uh, rational points of the group. That's like heck of characters. If, you, if this group were GL1, uh, this, this group would be A star, and this would be K star, and functions on G st A star mod K star decompose into characters. So uh, automorphic forms are a generalization of, of heck of L functions. And if it's in the uh, space of uh, automorphic forms, then we can construct the linear form that's invariant under HA, which is what we're interested in. What, is there a HOM? Uh, by taking the linear form, <coughs> um, by integrating, by embedding the space in the, function, in the space of automorphic forms, and then integrating an automorphic form over this coset HA mod HK. See, it's already invariant under HK, so you only have to integrate over this. And that's a much better prospect than integrating over this because this group is locally compact, but this quotient is a finite volume. And so if the, if the function you're trying to integrate is, say, a cusp form, you can make the integral, and it defines a linear form invariant under HA. And on the entire space of automorphic forms, that linear form is non-zero, but we want to know if it's non-zero on the image of this specific irreducible representation. That's the global question. And a necessary condition is that the local conjecture holds. Namely, we better have for each local component the dimension to be 1, because the dimension of this HOM space is the product of these dimensions. And so these better all be 1, so that there's a unique HOM. And uh, so that means that the local components of this representation that we're trying to test for this uh, integration over this adelic space, the, the local components better be the ones that we picked out in the L packet. And so if this HOM space is non-zero, then there's some hope that this period integral, that's what people call it, the integral of this linear form over this space, will also be non-zero because it's a one-dimensional vector space. Maybe we'll be lucky enough to get a basis. OK. Well, since the representations are distinguished in their L packet, we know the character is given by this epsilon formula. And in particular, the Haas of invid invariance of the local orthogonal spaces, that's the central elements, are given by this formula. OK, but since we have global orthogonal spaces, we have to have the product of the Haas of invariance is 1. That's Hilbert's form of quadratic reciprocity. And the product of these determinants is 1 by local class field theory. So that means the product of these local epsilon factors for the tensor product representation, that's what came up in the local conjecture, has to be plus 1. But that epsilon factor, whoops, is exactly the sign in the functional equation of this L function. These are, remember, these are representations of the Vey group, and we get, we get L functions for representations of the Vey group. And that L function, like the Tate's thesis, the product of local functions, and the sign in its functional equation is now plus 1 if we're in the space of automorphic forms. And so this 
That tells us that the L function, its functional equation, vanishes to even order at the point s equal a half. And the global conjecture is just that. This diagonal period integral is non-zero on this restriction if and only if the L function vanishes to order zero. And this is right in the center of the critical strip. It's a tricky point to study because the, this Euler product doesn't converge there. It only converges for real part of s greater than 1. So you first have to analytically continue the function. Then you have to evaluate it at s equal a half. And we conjectured that if it was non-zero at f s equal a half, then the period was non-zero, the integral was non-zero, and vice versa. Well, uh, there's a beautiful refinement that was discovered by Atsushi Ichino and Tamatsu Ikeda which gives an exact formula for this central value, the value at a half, in terms of the period and it, the product of the period and its complex conjugate. And the reason they were able to guess this formula was that unbeknownst to us, Balsberger had already proved it in 1985 for the restriction from SO3 to SO2, for the n equal 1 case. This was an incredible result, a huge, uh, huge influence. And he did this when he was a graduate student. In fact, I first heard him speak about this when I was at a conference at Durham when Zaghi and I, and I announced our result. And we each had to give six hours of talks at this conference. And I was completely exhausted. Birch, you were, you were responsible for this. And uh, I was completely exhausted. And the last day were some talks by graduate students, which I thought I could safely skip. But Marie-France Vigneras, who was a friend, said, no, 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 I have a very good graduate student. You have to go to the talk. And I went to this talk where Waldsberger talked about this result. I don't think I've ever been in a talk that's more, been more influential to me. In any case, there's a similar conjecture for the diagonal period when you restrict representations of unitary groups. And in that case, uh, the tensor product L function is much easier to understand because if you extend scalars to the quadratic extension field you've used to define your Hermitian space, it becomes a Rankin L function for GLN cross GLN minus 1. And there's some beautiful <coughs> integral formulas for that. And Wei Zhang made tremendous progress in this unitary case uh, towards the global conjecture, proved it, in fact, under very mild local hypotheses uh, using a relative trace formula of Jacquet and Rallis. And uh, that's one of the many things that he's going to be uh, cited for in the Clay Research Prize. And I should just say a word about this relative trace formula without getting myself buried. The usual trace formula studies orbital integrals, which are integrals over conjugacy classes in a group. And Mm, the linear form of a conjugacy class is the orbit of the group on its adjoint representation, on its Lie algebra. So you study uh, orbits of a uh, group on its Lie algebra, but the relative trace formula studies the orbits of un minus 1 on the Lie algebra of un, which is the direct sum of the Lie algebra of un minus 1 and, its standard, and the standard representation. And miraculously, you can still understand those orbits. The representation is co-regular. And uh, to attack this conjecture, Zhang not only has to study these integrals, but he has to compare them with the, the integrals for the orbits of GLN minus 1 on the Lie algebra of GLN. So that's a, that's a fundamental lemma that he had to prove. And there's a picture of Wei, and you'll be seeing more of him shortly. <laughs> OK, now the arithmetic conjecture. I'll finish with that if I haven't already run over my time a little bit. So that's going to study the first derivative of this exact same L function studied by Waltz-Percher in the case when the sign of the functional equation is minus 1. So the order vanishing by the functional equation is uh, odd. So this would be the first possible non-zero term. The value has to be 0 by the sign of the functional equation. Now, since the sign of the functional equation is minus 1, this representation does not come from a pair of orthogonal spaces over k. Because if it did, remember, the product of the local epsilons has to be plus 1 by Hilbert reciprocity. So we don't have a space of automorphic forms. They're nice idyllic groups, but you can't embed SO2n plus 1k cross SO2nk in that space. And so in those space of automorphic forms, what do we do? What do we do? Well, I only have a conjecture in this case when the, the local groups at infinity at the real places are compact. And then you get something that I call an incoherent definite orthogonal space. Namely, an incoherent definite orthogonal space over a number field is a collection of local spaces, almost all of them split or quasi-split at finite primes, uh, which are definite at the real places, and which do not patch together to form a global orthogonal space. So we have, we're in this situation when we're studying the derivative. If we make the assumption 
that the groups at infinity are compact. I have absolutely no idea what to do without making that assumption. But it's a nice assumption because it forces the number field to be totally real. You can't have a complex, compact group if you have a complex place. And it also means that the parameters are motivic. You don't, you don't get anything like Moss waveforms. Valsperger's theorem is completely general, and, and Weizhang's generalization of it is completely general. But in this case, you're going to just get things that come from what are called motives. All right, so simplicity, since, since the representation at, at, at the infinite component is compact, the local representations, W, V, T, so U, V are finite dimensional. I'll tell you what the conjecture is when they're the trivial representation for all places. That, that's obviously the simplest situation. And then this representation of the finite part of the adelic group, which is all we really have left because it's trivial at infinity, occurs in the cohomology of a, of a fantastic variety over the over the totally real field called the Shimura variety, which is associated to um, incoherent definite orthogonal data. There's one for the odd orthogonal group, which has dimension 2n minus 1, and there's one for the even orthogonal group, which has dimension 2n minus 2. And you take their product, you get an odd dimensional variety. And in the middle cohomology, the, you have an action on that variety of the uh, finite part of the orthogonal group and the Adels, and that group acts on the cohomology, and this representation will occur. And the great theory of Shimura varieties is that they're not just defined over the complex numbers where they start, but they descend to a number field. And in this case, this orthogonal Shimura variety actually is defined over our totally real field. And uh, this representation, we believe, but we can't prove, should occur in the Chow group of homologically trivial cycles of codimension 2n minus 1 on s over k. That's because this middle cohomology is, in some sense, a, a tangent space to the Chow group of homologically trivial cycles. If you think of a curve, the Chow group of homologically equivalent advisors is called the Jacobian. And the tangent space to the Jacobian is, comes from the first cohomology group. So this is supposed to be a generalization of that. If it occurs in cohomology, maybe it occurs in the Chow group. We know nothing about this Chow group, but here we go with the conjecture. And you can make a cycle in the Chow group from the Shimura variety of the diagonally embedded in data. And it has the right co-dimension. On this Chow group, which we know nothing about, Balenson and Bloch define something like the height pairing, like in their own Tate height on the Jacobian. And uh, so you can take the height pairing against this diagonally embedded cycle, and you get an invariant linear form. Isn't that great? That's like the period integral we got from the space of automorphic forms. But now we're getting it from the geometry of this Shimura variety. OK, and the global conjecture is the following. The following should be equivalent. This linear form is non-zero when I restrict to this eigen component. That's what we had for the period integral, right? The derivative is non-zero. The period integral was non-zero if the value was non-zero. So now the derivative should not be zero. And also, this representation occurs with multiplicity one in the Chow group. That already occurred in the space of automorphic forms. I kind of sloughed over that, but it does occur with multiplicity one. But here, the multiplicity should be the order of vanishing of the L function. At least that's the balenson block conjecture. So here we suspect it vanishes multiplicity one. And there's a refinement, of course, like, like the work of Ikeda and Ichino, that gives an exact formula for the derivative in terms of the height of this component of t against itself. So uh, when n is one, so we're going from SO3 to SO2, or three-dimensional incoherent spaces to two-dimensional incoherent spaces, uh, it's a, s is a Shimura curve, t is a divisor on s, so it's a bunch of points on the curve. And this exact formula that was conjectured was proven by Shou Zhang and his students. Uh, he has a whole group of students who have, who have populated this field and have made major contributions. And the final touches were put on the proof in 2013. And Shou has been a tremendous leader in this, in this field. I remember he attended a lecture I gave at a, a conference in Misery in 2001. And after that lecture, I just turned it over to him. He knew what he was doing. And, uh, when n is equal to 1, and the base field is q, and the group is split, then s is a modular curve. It's not just a Shimura curve, but something we actually know. And t is given by what are called Hegner points. And in that case, m is a two-dimensional symplectic representation. It corresponds to a new form of weight 2. n is a two-dimensional orthogonal representation induced from a character of an imaginary quadratic field. The Chow group is the more Delvey group of the Jacobian. We, we somehow know what we're doing here. And the neuron tate is given height of its projection to the f chi eigen component is given by this formula. This is the formula that I found with Zagier in, in 1982. 
And um, there you see that that, that that proves the equivalence of one and two, that the derivative is non-zero if and only if this projection is non-zero, because the height pairing is known to be non-degenerate in the case of a curve. So if the, then we get a point of infinite order. And when this point of infinite order has, uh, is non-zero, Coley Wagen proved that the corresponding component to the Mordell Bay group has rank one. That's the third part of the conjecture, that the rank is one, that the multiplicity is one. The part that we cannot prove yet is to go the other way and say, if the rank is one, then this projection of the Hegner point is non-zero. And that seems very difficult. People have been able to prove that under the assumption that the tate shafarevich group is finite, but in my opinion, that's the whole game. You assume that, you might as well assume the whole conjecture of Birch and Swinner and Dyer. Okay, here's a picture of Don and front page of our paper. It was taken at the time we wrote the paper. People have often asked me what it was like to work with Don Zadier at that time. So I can only say that in the middle of our work, I went into New York and I saw Peter Schaefer's play Amadeus with Ian McKellen and I, it resonated, it resonated, it resonated. So uh, unfortunately, this conjecture is hopeless at the moment because when n is large, we don't really understand the orthogonal Shimura variety very well, namely its points mod p are a little mysterious and to compute this height you have to know the points modulo all the primes p. However, there's a similar conjecture for a unitary Shimura varieties and in that case there's a, a, a variety which is rather close to what I want that has a modular interpretation uh, in terms of abelian varieties with endomorphisms and polarized abelian varieties with endomorphisms. And Fortunately, using that interpretation, uh, there's been a tremendous advance in the arithmetic case, in my opinion, by uh, Way and also Michael Rappaport and, and Brian Smithling, have made a lot of progress, I'll say, and this is a little bit vague, in computing the local heights of this diagonal cycle T. So I just want to end by saying, we're not at the end of the story, but as Churchill would say, we're at the end of the beginning of the story. And that makes, that one, I, want to, I want to emphasize that this is true for the Langlands conjectures too. None of this could be stated or worked on without Langlands's correspondences. People sometimes think that Langlands correspondence are the end of the story. That's what we're all we're supposed to be doing. But in fact, it's a tool that can be used to investigate things both in representation theory and in number theory by relating them. And to give you an example, this formula that Zagi and I proved, was a, it's a formula about, about points on modular curves. But it has tremendous application to the theory, to the conjecture of Birch and Swinnerton Dyer for elliptic curves, because we now know that every elliptic curve occur over Q occurs in the Jacobian of a modular curve, right? And so, with that aspect of the Langlands correspondence established, we get many applications. So I want to thank you, and with that mention of modularity, I'll turn you back to Andrew. Thank you.